Hey everybody, I am Jonathan Clark. Uh, I am with a gentleman who I am very honored to be with, uh, a guy who I've been playing on the radio for over 25 years. It's Dave Gahan from Depeche Mode. Nice you might remember the station WLIR. I do indeed. Back in the day in uh, Long indeed. Island. Yeah. Uh, Depeche Mode's new album is Spirit. It's the band's 14th studio album. Um, has the band been together for 37 years or have you been in the band for longer? We've, I think it's about 37 years that we've been releasing music, but yeah, we were together a, a couple of years before that, maybe a bit less than that. Um, I think I, I think when I joined the band, I was maybe just 18. Wow. So Rock and roll high school. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And by the time we were, you know, in our early 20s, we were already sort of traveling around places that we yeah. never imagined that we would go to, you know. So, right. Um, we all grew up on like like council estates, East London. Yeah, yeah. Um, really not much prospect of doing everything other, other than becoming a car thief or a rock, a rock and roll <laughs> I, band. I want to get to that <laughs> later. Um, meanwhile, fast forward, 100 million albums sold. I, and this is very special for me, as I, as I mentioned before. I remember playing 12-inch remixes of Enjoy the Silence and Personal Jesus vinyl. Mm -hmm. And you had like, there was like a 20 minute, maybe even longer, mm -hmm. a 20 minute remix of some of those songs. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I read on the website that you are planning on doing some more of that mm -hmm. for this album. You're gonna have a, a remix sort of EP or? Yeah, there's, there's actually been a lot of remixes, reworkings done of Where's Re Revolution, the first song we pulled off the record. Um, and there's been some really cool, very old school kind of 12 inch mixes done by Simeon Mobile Disco. Uh -huh. And actually James Ford, who's part of Simeon Mobile Disco, produced the album. Yeah. But he did these 12 inches where there's a kind of dub version, uh, instrumental version and then there's a vocal version but they've they're really in that kind of old-school 12 inch vibe right um, which yeah I mean stuff like personal Jesus when we put personal Jesus out on a white label it it, it sold it literally sold a million copies before the song was even released right, back yeah. in the day. Um, it was one of the highest selling 12 inches, you know, that it, had I think ever it was, come. It was charting on the club charts as yeah. well as the alternative. Before, way before the album came out. We, right. put, we, we put stuff like out there before a record, you used to do stuff like that and, you know, before the internet and all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, it was kind of cool. So it became sort of a cult thing, but um, on a kind of a huge scale. Yeah. It was underground, but right. there was a lot of people And then it blew so, yeah, up. Yeah. Um, the band rehearsal that I was incredibly lucky to witness the other night, absolutely a fantastic experience. Thank you for letting us watch that, by the way. Uh, it was so amazing. Uh, a lot of the po most popular, well-known Depeche songs you guys played, some new ones as well. But I also heard David Bowie's Heroes. Oh, you were there for that, yeah? I was there uh, for yeah, that. Like, that was now, cool, yeah. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, Vince Clark saw you play that and that was the moment he was like, I gotta get this guy in my band? Yeah, it was something like that. Um, that, that story changes a bit. The truth of it is, we, I was rehearsing with this other band in a, in a room next door to where Vince was rehear rehearsing with what was to become Depeche Mode. Um, they were called Composition of Sound at the time. Yes. And um, so at one point, uh, towards the end of when we were just messing around, um, someone started playing the riff to Heroes, and I got up on the mic, and, and a couple of other people got up on the mic as well. It wasn't just me. <laughs> it was um, but when, but, but Yeah, but when, <laughs> but when Vince kind of uh, called me up um, a couple of weeks later, or whatever it was, and said, you know, was you singing here? I was, I was yeah. Yeah, you know, hello. Um, yeah. And uh, he said, you want to come and, uh, you know, sit in, or maybe come down and sit in on some rehearsals? And I was like, yeah, all right. And I went down, and, and that was it, really. They had a couple of gigs. Um, and I actually went to a couple of gigs of theirs at first, and I could see they really did need a front guy. It was kind of like they had something going on, but the, the, Vince was singing at the time, and he was behind a keyboard, sort of, and it wasn't working. So, yeah, I, I lucked. I lucked out. I just uh, blagged my way into the band on that song. Yeah. And so, really, when we we started rehearsing, I, I brought up the idea of maybe doing a Bowie cover, especially after Bowie, you know, losing Bowie as well and him, him yeah. dying. Uh, was really sad and Martin and I are both huge Bowie fans and have been since we were teenagers so um, and, and still are and so it just seemed right it right. just seemed right to do something and Martin was into it we did discover 
Um, and it, it's got a real Depeche, early Depeche flavour about it, yeah, but, it does, it's, yeah. but it's Bowie, of course. Yeah. Um, and, um, and, and it's 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 actually it's actually spine. You know, your whole sort of you start tingling when you sing it. Uh, there's something special about well, it. You have a unique connection to David Bowie because your children went. Still my daughter. the same school, right? Uh, well, actually, actually, I think Lexi's coming back for a little bit, but uh, my, my daughter's in high school, she's in her last year, but, and Lexi sort of le was pulled out of school for a bit, but they spent a few years together in school. So I'd see David, like, uh, you know, at school stuff. Right. Um, Parent-teacher uh, conference. Yeah, well, yeah, 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 not so much that, but, like, if there was, like, a school concert or whatever, and, you know, we'd sort of say hi, we didn't talk that much, but... Um, I kind of wish I had, you know, I wish I had. Right. I just kind of told him how much his music meant to, to me. I did meet him um, a few years before that in the, in the city, actually. I think they, it was, uh, they were doing a special show where he was performing the entirety of Low, the album Low, from start to finish, and I got invited to it, and I met him after the show, and we talked for a bit, that, that was nice. And the band also did a thing at the Highline something or other? A, yeah, that's... Shot, like a it, film or something? It wasn't or? a show. We At the end of the recording of this album, when we finished recording Spirit, we decided to do a sort of broken down version of maybe sort of four or five of the songs from the record, and um, Tim Sashenti filmed the whole thing in 360, so we, oh, we, wow. we kind of got that. And we, it was in the Highline studio, so in this big cavernous room. And there was just a few people there watching. Um, but there we did a version of Heroes as well, which turned out really well. I haven't seen the film yet, but I've heard them. I've heard all the tracks. They sound really cool. Yeah. Um, the new album, 12 songs, uh, including the first single, Where's the Revolution. And after listening to it, the album, to me, sounds a little throwbackish maybe perhaps to the Violator album? Was that something that you sort of just witnessed as it was happening, or was there sort of an intentional way to get uh, some of the old grooves back in there? You don't consciously do something like that, really. We don't, we don't consciously sit, sit down and do something like that. But I understand what you're saying. I mean, when I listen to the album now, now that it's finished and everything, I think what's interesting about it, in a way, is that it is like an album, an old school album, where it, it's, there's 12 songs, you know, we were going to maybe at one point only have 10, but we decided on the 12 in the end. And it has a, that flow to it, where it's like an old vinyl record. It's yeah. got two sides. Yeah, and the sequencing is yeah, really the, the good. The sequencing is really important on any record. but And some records now, I find that when they've got 17, 18, 19 tracks, you've got five on there that you're like, OK, that's losing me. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and I... To be honest, it's too much to listen to. I can't take it in. I like records that, are, at the most, got 12 songs. Well, when did, when you were guys just issuing stuff on vinyl, how many songs could you put on a vinyl album? There would be 10. Would I, be mean, 10 right? tops, I mean, tops, yeah. maybe nine even, to really get a good quality sound on there. With this one, we are putting it out on vinyl. We've had to make uh, three sides. Yeah. There's actually three, three, three. Oh. Uh, parts to the album and then there's a fourth piece that's just kind of a, a, a special picture disc with the spirit sort of ghostly written across it but we couldn't to get the good quality on there we had to put it over four side uh, three sides yeah um we're very happy that once again dave gahan has three of his songs on this new Thank album you. Uh, the, some of the dave gahan new songs in the set for the tour um, still working that out? We're or? still working that out a bit but at the moment we're definitely doing uh, poison heart and um which is great. Uh, it feels really great, and we're, and probably going to be doing cover me as well. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, so you've been doing this a long time, obviously. I just looked at the lyric video for "Where's the Revolution," the first single. Does it blow your mind that four million people have already watched this? Uh, That's a just bit. a lyric video. Yeah, a little <laughs> bit. Um, um, but it, it does actually. Um, in such a short period of time, um, like the, the, that many people would keep watching the video uh it is a bit mind-blowing but that's that's how it moves now yeah that's how, that's how everything moves it's much faster and uh instantaneous almost. and it's interesting because a lot of all the old videos are all up on online now as well um and it's interesting to see how many are, are being watched again and which ones you can kind of almost like decide on what you're going to play live from just looking at what right, yeah, you yeah. know like it's what, like a like, chart almost yeah, right it, it almost is uh, I was looking at it the other day and I was sort of going down oh yeah oh we're not doing that and maybe we should it was kind of <laughs> I was, you know um, Anton Corbin a long time you know collaborator photographer yeah. video director yeah. for you guys and he directed the official video for the yes yeah uh, Where, where's the revolution which is song. pretty funny I think uh, it's quite it's, it's got a lot there's of like, there's a lot of humor in it yeah um, you know. and there always is kind of you have to with Anton's videos there's always this sort of strange little twist to them that's a bit humorous and sometimes people get it and sometimes you don't but 
I think the video is uh, pretty powerful. I think it's one of the better videos he's made it with is. us for a it's few years. It's really yeah. good. I love yeah. it. Thanks. Um, have you read Steve Jones' book from the Sex Pistols? I haven't, but I want to because I've been looking Lonely at lots. Boy. I've been yeah, I've been looking at lots of little clips. And Steve and I are old mates. I lived in LA for right. seven years, and um, you know sometimes we bump into each other. But um, and if he came to New York for a bit, when I, once I moved here, we hung out for a little bit. Um, uh, so I haven't seen him for a long time, but I'm trying to get somebody to get, help me to get onto his show so I can... Oh, yeah, Jonesy's Jukebox. Yeah, because yeah. I know that's how I'm running again. So. Um, and the reason I bring that up is it seems that you and he both had a knack for... Burglary. Let me, let me put this down. <laughs> borrowing people's cars. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, driving and taking away, they used to call it in England. Right. And, and as a teenager, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, but... Um, luckily, I found music. I got, I've, by the time, like I said, I was about 17, <laughs> um, I realised if I kept hanging with this crew, uh, it wasn't going to end well. And something inside of me was like, you got to do something. And luckily, yeah. Vince Clark made that phone call and, uh, you know, I, I found a new hobby. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> and Jonesy actually was also good at another thing, borrowing... Uh, people's bands equipment. Yeah, that like thing, famous bands. Famous bands. I think there's a story where they went into the back of the Kinks uh, yeah. studio. Or Rod Stewart. Uh, or, yeah, or something. Or something like and that. they would uh, go into the back of the hall where the gap bands were playing, and that's how they got their, the right. Sex Pistols. Just take I think, it right out the door. Most of their early equipment. See you probably. later. Yeah. 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 Well. <laughs> whatever it takes. Um, I want to ask you about an urban legend. Now, I don't know if this is true. That therefore it's called an urban legend. Uh, Depeche Mode, you did play CBGBs, right? Um, Seymour Stein pulled up in a limo. The door to the club opened. Your music came blasting out onto the Bowery, you know, the Bowery. Seymour never got out of the car. He rolled down his window, listened to like a minute of you blasting out of CBGBs, and then told his assistant to go sign you guys. Um, well, that's a good story. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a little different. Actually, Seymour came all the way over to London when we were this little band playing in these little clubs as well. And he did show up to this little club in Essex, which is 30 miles east of London. Um, uh, this little place, I can't remember what it was called. I think it was uh, Rack Earls Club. And uh, we were doing a little set in there. And he came backstage afterwards. Uh, there was maybe like 50 people watching us or whatever, mostly our friends. And uh, he, he wanted to sign us immediately. Yeah. He wanted to sign us. He kind of, I mean, and Seymour was, and still is around, but and he's a great guy, but um, he's got a fantastic ear. But at that time, he has, he was signing at Talking Heads and like all, uh, stuff that we were really. The tenders. Yeah, you know. I mean, you know, the list is huge. I yeah. mean, um, and uh, yeah, he wanted to sign us. And uh, I think at that point, we had only put out a couple of singles. Um, so, and he was one of those guys that like took a risk, you know, listening to the Ramones or, or stuff like that, where he would go back to the record company and say, look, I found it. And they were like, this is rubbish. Right, yeah. right but, but he, you know, he was ahead of the time. And then look at the roster later, unbelievable. Yeah, exactly. Is it still a rush for you to play Madison Square Garden? The, the garden especially. I mean, I go to the garden on a regular basis because so I'm a big Knicks fan. Oh, and I've well, been okay, all right. season ticket holder for, I, I guess, like 12 years or something now. But um, my son here, Jimmy, got me into basketball. And, um, you know, we, I think we got him season tickets when he was like 15 or something. He's in his 20s now. But, um, yeah, we, we go together. And my friends go, you know, and um, so it's a bit disappointing at the moment, uh, to oh, be honest. Well, I can't really yeah. talk about it. I mean, yeah. uh, but playing the garden is a whole another thing. Right. I mean, you just walk up on that stage and, you know, the Stones, Zeppelin, like just all the stuff that he knows. It's, well, you walk down the hallways and you yeah, see the Yeah, it's photos, royalty. Right? It's rock and roll royalty. So, yeah. um, and for me, it's like I, I kind of have to pinch myself a bit. And always, it's my hometown gig. I've been in New York um, almost 20 years now, so... You know, a lot of friends come in. I look out. It's a bit. Sometimes, you know, you, you see people you know. I, I don't really like that, to be yeah, honest. No, that's I mean, kind of, yeah. It's kind of weird. But um, at the same time, it's it's usually quite a fantastic night. I know you're looking forward to stadium shows we got over a bunch in, Europe. in Europe right now. Yeah, and eat like Eastern Europe places, right? We're, like uh, we we announced. Um, a, a couple of months ago, um, I think it's like 35 shows or something, and sta mostly stadiums here yeah, across Europe, and um, 
we've they've they've pretty much all sold out. We've sold over a million tickets in the space of like you know a couple of months um, before the records even come out. So yeah, we have pretty hardcore following over there. So we're doing that, and we're about to announce some more shows now in Europe because they're pretty much sold out. It's fantastic. His name is Dave Gahan, Depeche Mode, the new album Spirit. And uh, check them out on tour uh, throughout 2017 and probably and, 2018, oh, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, it's going to go on this one. Uh, DepecheMode.com. And uh, Dave, thank you so much. Cheers, thanks, man. You got it. Thank you.